Tijuana is the largest professional association in North America for the waste industry. It really connects people within the industry to share their ideas, to share their challenges. There's a lot more focus on safety. There's a lot more focus on responding to media. To be more visible in the advocacy space, speaking with the United States EPA, working on Capitol Hill. The local chapters support legislation that maybe need it from the counties. SWANA supports the local chapters where they put on training opportunities. We offer training in almost everything. In this industry, you see a lot of job postings that are looking for folks that are SWANA certified. We aren't just answering the question of safety, but we're also answering to future generations. We have seasoned professionals and the young professionals get together and they talk about all sorts of topics. Whether it's recycling, waste to energy, whether it's landfilling, digestion. It's always industry is changing and we realize that we need to change with it. I am Swana. I am Swana. I am Swana. 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 Please welcome to the stage Swana's International Board President, Jeff Murray. Good morning, and welcome to the 56th annual WasteCon. This is my 15th straight WasteCon, and as always, I look forward to the networking opportunities, but this year, I'm especially excited to attend the special keynote sessions on leadership development this week. David Briley is the eighth mayor of the Metropolitan Government of Nashville and Davidson County. Mayor Briley is a native Nashvillian and the grandson of Beverly Briley the first mayor of the Metropolitan Government of Nashville in Davidson County. Please give a warm swan and welcome to Nashville's mayor, David Briley. Well, good, good morning, everybody. Uh, thanks for that kind introduction and uh, welcome to Nashville. Uh, it's great to have you all here. Uh, 2,000 participants in all. This morning as I was getting ready to come to, to the SWANA conference, I, I thought about my job as mayor and about how, um, how waste fit into it. And so I brought a poop bag um, because it seems to be that's a significant part of my job is walking around town picking up both literal and figurative poop. The figure, the, the literal sometimes is easier than the, the, than the other, um, but I seem to do a fair amount of both. Now, Nashville, my, as, as, as was said, my grandfather was mayor here in the 60s and 70s, and Nashville had uh, a, a unique, well, not a pretty unique uh, American experience with, with our solid waste back then. We had a waste to energy facility downtown, and, um, and it was there for, I guess, almost 40 years that we operated it downtown, and it was our primary um, uh, means of disposal of waste. And we had flow control, which you used to be able to have, and so it was also sort of a profit center for our, for our town. But after we lost flow control and, and closed uh, what we called thermal transfer, we entered into a long-term contract with one of the big um, companies doing uh, waste, uh, doing landfilling. Uh, and so that's what we've been doing for, I guess, almost 20 years now. That landfill has got only six or seven years left in its lifespan. So we're starting to think here in Nashville about how we're going to uh, address things going forward. And uh, we've started a, a food waste challenge where we're trying to get as many restaurants and uh, big food uh, users to send their waste to, a, um, to an anaerobic digester that we're going to build. Uh, additionally, we're um, we're gonna we only in Nashville we only do re curbside recycling once a week. Or, sorry, once a month. We're trying to move to twice a month to make progress on that. And um, and additionally, we if you've been down to Lower Broad, very close to where our old waste energy facility was, you might have consumed a long neck beer. We have started a. a, a, a relatively unique 
um, recycling program downtown where we're just collecting glass from all of those restaurants and, it's, and bars, and it's being uh, pretty successful. So um, uh, Nashville has the goal of being the greenest city in the southeast. It's a goal we've had since 2007, and we make progress on it uh, intermittently, I will admit. It's, it's hard for us to, in, in the southeast sometimes to make as much progress as we want on these kind of issues. Um, but we are making some progress here. So I hope you enjoy Nashville. I hope you have a chance to interact with some of our Public Works employees. I know at least one of them is here today. And um, if you uh, consume an extra beer or two, it'll help us with our recycling program downtown. So please do. Thank you. Thank you again, Mr. Mayor. At this year's WasteCon, we want to spend a significant portion of our time educating and inspiring ourselves to work in new ways. Education is often undervalued, undervalued, and as professionals, we can get lost in trying to be perfect and doing our jobs correctly and may miss those opportunities to nurture our curiosity. This focus on curiosity and education is not just good for us as solid waste professionals. It is also great for our business to stay current and to learn to solve our problems in new ways. That's why we are kicking off WasteCon with a highly interactive design thinking learning experience led by our friends from Stoked. Stoked is a design consultancy whose mission is to awaken the human spirit. They do that by helping global organizations, teams, and individuals get in touch with their innate creative abilities, building competence and confidence to work in new ways. As Stoked gets started, remember this is a new way of thinking and working. It will feel new and sometimes uncomfortable. So focus on learning the process, not on trying to figure out the outcome. That will come later. Open your mind and let's have some fun. I'm excited to introduce you to Stoked. Awesome. That's pretty good, right? <laughs> yeah, just all right. <laughs> Hi, my name is Parker Gates. I'm Barbara Patchen. And we're with Stoked. And uh, Stoked is a global innovation consultancy. Um, what does that mean? What is a global innovation consultancy? So we work with lots of different types of organizations all over the world across many different industries to teach them how to bring new products and new services and new user experiences to life. Um, and we do that primarily by a process called design thinking, which is a little bit about what we're going to show you today. Um, if we have our deck up, there we go. Awesome, thanks. So there's a couple of things that we think are really important that we want to jump into before we get started. Um, Barb and I are going to do a little bit of talking, and then quickly we're going to jump into a whole lot of doing. Uh, to, to reframe that a little bit, you're gonna do a whole lot of doing. So, um, but there's a couple things that we think are really important before we get started. The first one is this idea that um, innovation is kind of a byproduct of a really amazing culture. Uh, and what I mean by that is that um, you can teach a, a really great methodology like design thinking or Six Sigma or Lean or Agile or any of those methodologies to an organization but if the culture is not one to really accept it and grab on and embrace something new and embrace change, then that's, that, that culture is gonna have a really hard time uh, actually practicing and deploying any methodology. So we think that having a really wonderful culture is a great way to get started in, uh, in an innovation practice. The second thing that we believe in that we're gonna ask you to practice a little bit today is that design unlocks creativity. So if we're all here today to try to solve problems in a new way or to be more innovative, we have to be creative. So uh, let's do a little poll. I'm gonna ask all of you to put your cell phones down and use your hands and tell me how many of you think that you are creative. That's quite a bit. That's about half the room. Yeah. Typically this ends up being about fourth the, a fourth of the room. Um, but what's interesting is that most of the time, as adults, fewer and fewer hands go up. And what we know is that all of us are innately creative. However, sometime between first grade and fifth grade, we split into two camps. 
those that are practical and those that will get real jobs, and those that are creative. They are not mutually exclusive. So today we're gonna ask you to lean into that innate creativity. And then the last thing that we think is really important is that a sense of transformation, if you're an organization that knows that you need to start looking ahead, you need to start leapfrogging the competition, you know that you have to change with the times, that that transformation begins with a real sense of self-awareness. And what I mean by self-awareness is, are, what are the behaviors that I embody? How do I treat my coworkers? How do I treat my leaders? How do I treat my employees? And this is really important, right? Because if I'm not self-aware, if I don't know what my behaviors are like, then I have no ability to change my behaviors. I have no, no idea what behaviors are really helping the innovation process or practice take root in my organization, and I don't know which behaviors are hindering innovation from really happening. And so what we're gonna ask you guys to do here today as you get started is we're gonna ask you to really be mindful of your own mindset. Like when we get started, we're gonna ask you to do a few things that might feel a little bit uncomfortable, hopefully. <laughs> and uh, we want you to be really mindful about like your reaction to that. Like, does it make you nervous? Does it make you feel a little bit vulnerable? Uh, how, do you, how do you behave when you're in those situations, when you're in a slightly uncomfortable situation? How do you react? How do you behave? So we're gonna ask you to be a little bit mindful about that. So what are these mindsets that Parker is mentioning? We've actually gone ahead and named them for you. So doing this work for about eight years with multiple organizations all over the world, we've learned a few things about what behaviors really help individuals, teams, and organizations be creative and innovative. And the first one is a focus on human values. So we're gonna talk about design thinking today. It's also referred to as human-centered design. And basically that means that the human being, the user, the customer, the resident, that is our major point of truth. So in most processes or in organizations, we wait for policy to inform us. We are often reactionary uh, when we need to change. In the world of design thinking, instead, we're gonna focus on our user and try to really understand their unmet needs and motivations in order to design something for them. Mm. The second mindset that we wanna like kinda highlight uh, before we get started is this idea of show, don't tell. Uh, so I have, we have another question for you, um, and that is how many of you have had a really good idea about something new that you wanted to implement, maybe a change you wanted to make, and you took that really great idea that you had. Maybe you had it in the shower one morning and you're like, oh my God, that's a really great idea. And then you get to the office and the first thing you do with that idea is that you put it into an email. You type it up and you put it in black and white text and then you send it to somebody. Maybe you copy, I don't know, six or eight people, kind of see what their reaction is, gauge their, their reaction. And then, uh, and, and that's, where you're, that's how you present your big idea. Can I get a show of hands on how many people have done that? Yeah, I know, it's embarrassing. It's hard to raise your <laughs> hand, I get it. I totally get it, it's okay. Uh, I've done it too. Um, you know, what we find usually happens when we do that is that uh, we, we don't get people uh, inspired. We don't often, uh, people aren't often enthusiastic about the idea that we have. Typically, actually, what happens is that uh, they tend to respond with what can't be done. Well, there's not enough time. You know, there's not enough money. We don't have enough space for that. We don't have the resources. There's not the bandwidth. There is this, like, analytical critique that comes with sending your ideas in an email. Uh, so what we're gonna show you today, what you're gonna practice, is this idea of giving somebody something to respond to uh, that uh, brings them along for the ride and lets them experience your idea versus trying to understand your idea. This third one is embracing experimentation. And this is just being willing to tinker, learn, and perhaps kind of fail along the way in really small ways. So a lot of times when we think of innovation, we think of people, we think of Steve Jobs, we think of a person who was able to come up with a big idea that impacted the world. But oftentimes innovation is not one person or it's not a bunch of leaders in a conference room. It's starting with one idea and iterating along the way based on what we're learning about our user. So we're gonna ask you to do a little bit of tinkering and learning along the way today. Mm. This next one is a bias to action. Uh, we've, yeah, we've, we've had this great opportunity to work with some of the world's largest companies. I mean, massive companies that are global and doing amazing things. Companies whose products we use every single day. And uh, it's fascinating to learn how slow they are to move on things. Um, and so when we talk about a bias to action, if you have an idea, 
um, if you want to try something, the typical thing that we do is we say, oh, I've got this amazing idea. Uh, I'm going to put a meeting together. So I'm going I'm to book six or eight people for a meeting. That's going to take three days to get everybody's you know, availability. And then, uh, and then we need a team of people to build a deck for the meeting. Um, we should actually have a small meeting for the team that's going to build the deck that will be for the big meeting. Uh, and then we'll have a conference call to prep for that really quick, right? <laughs> yeah, I know. I hear you. I totally hear you. So the, what we're saying is that if you have an idea, why not do what Barb just talked about? Why not embrace experimentation, build something really quickly, get a response from an actual customer, and then take that information to somebody and share that. That's, it's a really different way of working, um, but it moves much quicker. So we'll, you'll get a feel for what a bias to action feels like in, in about six minutes. The next one is mindful of process, and this is all about how we collaborate. So today you're going to have a chance to work with other people in this room, um, and it's been really important that we're on the same page at the same time. So I know that I've had this personal experience, I'm sure that you have too. When you come to a meeting, you're excited to solve a problem and you have some ideas and you're ready to share them. And you start to share them and you learn really quickly that your boss or whoever's sitting next to you hates your ideas and tells you, we don't have the time, we don't have the money because they're in execution mode. So while you're off generating ideas, they're ready to get to move, right? And we're on different, we're on different pages. So what we're gonna ask you to do is actually call out, are we generating? Great, we're all gonna be open-minded to any idea. Or are we evaluating? Okay, we're gonna do that together versus doing them apart. And the final one that we think is really important is this concept of radical collaboration. Uh, and what I mean by that is traditionally what we do, um, say, as designers, Barb and I would want to start a project of some kind, some kind of innovation project, and then we'd say, hey, let's call five of our designer friends to come over and help us do this. The problem with that is that then you have, you know, six or seven designers all thinking the same way because we've all read the same books, we all watch the same movies, we all listen to the same records, we're kind of the same person. So if I want real diversity of perspective, if I want a more holistic approach to this project, then I should bring in a more diverse team, a more holistic team. So why wouldn't I invite in maybe my neighbor who is a, a lawyer for a healthcare company or um, call uh, my wife to come in who's art director for a magazine or uh, you know, put together a much more diverse team so that the perspectives are radically different and we get multiple approaches to a single problem versus uh, a lot of the same approaches to a single problem. All right, y'all, this is the process. This is design thinking. How many of you have heard of design thinking before? Okay, uh, a couple of you. So we're actually gonna go through this process today, and we're gonna teach it to you in a linear format. And the first mode is empathy. So we talked about that focus on human values. In order to understand our customer, understand whoever it is that we want to create an innovation for, we have to understand their perspective. So we're gonna start with empathy. After we uh, understand the perspective, we'll get really clear about what we want to solve for. Then we're going to come up with a bunch of ideas, hopefully some crazy ones, things that have never been done before. And then we're actually going to build one of those ideas and test it with our user. So you're going to have an opportunity to practice this process today on a project that's not work-related, hopefully a little bit of fun this morning. Um, but before we do that, we want to tell you a little bit of a story so you can see how this works. Mm. So, the first story that we want to talk about is, uh, who here is familiar with Nintendo? Yeah, right? All right, so most of you are familiar with Nintendo. Um, I was kind of a child of the 80s, so I grew up with Nintendo. Uh, I never had one in my house, but my friends always had one, and I was always super jealous about it. Um, <laughs> but the Nintendo Entertainment System, what was referred to as NES, and then the Super Nintendo Entertainment System, were kind of the rulers of the video game world for a long time. Back in the early 80s, a lot of you will remember that Atari was the big player, but then Nintendo came in. Um, and then right in the early 90s, what started to happen was that other players started to get into this space. And so in particular, uh, you guys have probably heard of the Sony PlayStation. So Sony, uh, who'd been making consumer electronics for a long time, got into this space as well as uh, Microsoft with the Xbox. And so what had happened was that they were focusing uh, very strictly on kind of what, what is considered to be the hardcore gamer market. So these are the people that play first-person shooter games. They're kind of in there for you know, hours at a time. They have the headsets on and the, like, the 
crazy chairs, and uh, they play online with lots of other people. Maybe some of you play. Um, and so they kind of really started to go after that market. And Nintendo's market share started to drop and drop and drop. And when they started to get into uh, both Microsoft and um, Nintendo started to get into this market where they were understanding like what movement looked like or what 3D rendering looked like of a space, 4D, 4D rendering. Um, they started to uh, come up with new concepts. And so uh, Nintendo came up with the Wii and they launched it and it bombed horribly with the hardcore gamer market uh, in early stage testing. So um, when they were out there testing this stuff, it didn't do well, they thought it was silly, nobody wanted to play tennis or golf or ping pong or any of these games. They wanted to play these you know, hardcore first person shooter games where you got to you know, shoot your friends. And um, <laughs> so uh, what they did is they said, man, we, we think we're onto something. It tested really well with a younger market, which has never been a market that video game makers went after. It tested really well with like four-year-olds and five-year-olds and three-year-olds. And so they said, oh, man, that's really interesting. We've been focusing on this like 15 to 25-year-old market. Uh, what happens if we focus on really young people, if we focus on toddlers, and then we're going to go to the radical other end of the spectrum, the market that nobody is serving, which is the elderly. And so they started taking this and testing it with older people, and they found that uh, it worked really, really well. It increased mobility, and people were getting up, and they enjoyed the games because they're fun, and they're wholesome, and you're not killing your friends. Um, yes. And they really got to you know, enjoy playing ping pong and stuff. So I, I, I guess I bring this story to bear because innovation is not always about creating a new thing. It's about taking a look at where your thing exists, where your service, where your experience, where your product lives in the world. Can it be suited to a different market? Uh, can it be um, put out into the world in a different context from where it is now? Hmm. So what's next? Yeah, what is next? <laughs> All right, so we're done talking at you. Um, design thinking is a little bit of a misnomer. Uh, I'll say that out loud. Uh, it's a little bit more about design doing. And so for the next 90 minutes or so, you're gonna go through an experience uh, that allows you to actually practice, try on design thinking. Um, we decided a long time ago that we were not interested in selling design thinking. We weren't here to defend it or convince you that you needed it. Uh, what we are interested in is giving you an experience and letting you draw your own conclusions uh, about its efficacy. So, um, the first thing that we need to do, we need to establish a couple of quick ground rules. And the very first one is, is that this is gonna be a partnered exercise. You are going to partner with one other person at your table uh, for the next 90 minutes or so. So here's what we're gonna ask. If you can't commit to being here for 90 minutes, we're actually gonna ask that you move to a different table or, or, or skip out. You can totally watch if you want to. It's not gonna be worth much if you just watch. Um, but what you're going to do is you're going to commit to being there with your partner for the next 90 minutes because if you get up and leave halfway through, then you leave your partner kind of high and dry. So, um, so if you want to bounce, if you don't want to sit here for 90 minutes, now is the time to get up and move around. All right, you're committing. I see some of you running. It's all right. You're scared. I get it. It's totally fine. Totally fine. You're going to miss out on easily the funnest thing that we have all day, though. All right, for the rest of you, please identify a partner. And if you need to move up or find a different table, do that now. Wow, it's like 30%. Mm -hmm. <laughs> All right, so that was your first design challenge, identifying a partner. If you do not have a partner, will you please raise your hand we have folks walking around that can help you find somebody. Raise your hand if you don't have a partner. <laughs> All right. Once you have a partner, you're going to want to grab one of these, which is in the center of your table. Every person's going to need one of these and a Sharpie. All right, everybody have a workbook. 
We're just going to start moving here, so catch up if you can. Grab your workbook. You've got your partner. Please raise your hand if you do not have a partner. That's the only thing we ask. All right. So what are we up to for the next 90 minutes? We're going to be reimagining the morning routine for our partner. Everybody get that? We're going to be reimagining the morning routine for our partner. So here's what I'm going to ask that you guys do. Really quickly, if you will, play along with me. Close your eyes. And I want you to think about your morning routine uh, this morning. I want you to think about this morning in particular. What was it like to wake up? How did you wake up? Was there an alarm? What happened when you got out of bed? Where did you go first? What did you do? Did you check your phone? Did you go brush your teeth? What's going through your mind first thing in the morning? Were you thinking about the day's events or what's going on at home while you're not there? Maybe what the kids are doing, who's letting the dog out? Then how did you start to get ready? As you start to imagine your morning routine, what happened next? Cool. All right, you can open your eyes. That was your morning experience. What we're going to have you do now is we're going to have you kind of put that aside for a second, and we're going to think about someone else's morning experience or someone else's morning routine. And the way that we're going to do that is we're going to start very simply by gaining empathy. Uh, now, there's lots of definitions for empathy, but um, some of them are understanding how other people feel or uh, putting yourself in someone else's shoes. Um, but we think it's uh, radically important to understand the person that we're designing for before we start designing for them. And the way that we do that is we're going to start with a very simple conversation. And that conversation uh, we're going to use to elicit stories. We want to draw stories out of the partner that we've uh, kind of partnered up with here at our tables. And we want to ask very specific questions like, can you tell me about what it was like to wake up, I don't know, last Sunday? Tell me about waking up last Sunday. What was your morning routine on Sunday? What was the best morning you've had in a while? Or tell me about the most frustrating morning you've had recently. So we want to get very specific stories out of people. What we don't want to do is we don't want to say, hey, in general, what's your morning routine like? The reason we don't want to do that is because it's really hard to frame up all of our mornings into one story, right? So we want to get very specific, the best, the worst, the most recent. Um, so what we're going to do is we're actually going to give you an opportunity to, we're going to tell you a little bit about doing this, and then we're going to show you how to do it, and then we're going to give you an opportunity to do it. Cool? All right, great. So we would love to welcome up our esteemed collaborator, Jacob Jones. Come on up, Jacob. Can we give Jacob a round of applause real quick? Yeah. Yeah, Jacob. <laughs> yeah. Check. All right, it's on. Nice, nice. All right. Good morning. So, Jacob, I'm going to be designing for you. Uh, for purposes of a, a demo. Right. So I've got some questions for you. Fire away. Okay, so my first question is I want you to tell me about the worst morning that you've had in recent history. This morning. This morning. <laughs> Pretty bad. Okay, uh, can, you, can you walk me through it? Yeah, so, um, well, as you know, outside of the work I do with Stoked, I, I DJ old soul parties. Deep. And one of the parties I DJ is on Monday night, so I don't get home until about 3 in the morning on a Monday. My alarm went off this morning at 6.30. <laughs> so that was a start, um, which was fine. I was prepared for that. But was the, the wrench was my um, four-and-a-half-year-old, Henry, just started a new pre-K where he has to be at school an hour earlier than he's used to. So he used to get up closer to like 7.30, 7.45. Now he gets up at 6.45, and he's four, but he acts like he's 14, <laughs> and he hates it. So I have three hours of sleep. My wife and I got him up. We have our two-year-old. We're also trying to get ready in the same amount of time because he has to go with my wife to take the older one to school. Anyway, he was pouting extra hard and wouldn't get his PJs off, and I was like trying my best to help before I came here. And I was, you know, just kind of like, all right, buddy, like, we got to just, come on, let's, let's just change you. And he just flipped out. 
just melt down city. And then I had to go, so he's melting down. And I just looked at my wife and I was like, I was trying to help, sorry. Oh my goodness, okay. That's a lot. And, and in, in this moment where he's kind of flipping out and you have to leave, what does that feel like? What did that feel like? I mean, it, it felt bad because I, I, I looked at my watch. I was like, I have like eight minutes before I need to walk out the door. I will try to make an impact here for her, for, for my wife. So I was like, I will try to get one of them dressed. Um, and then, of course, all I did was create chaos for her to deal with while I walked out the door. Uh. Okay, that's, Total backfire. that's interesting. Um, you said try to make an impact. Can you explain why you feel that that's important? Uh, yeah. Uh, well, my wife takes, them to, takes Henry to school five days a week, and so she has to deal with this every morning, and, then, um, and I often help, but sometimes I'm out the door to work. And like I said, Monday nights, I'm always getting in in the middle of the night, so every Tuesday, she usually lets me sleep in if I'm, if I'm uh, not here this morning. So uh, I don't know. I just try if I'm gonna, if I'm gonna be up, I don't want to be an extra burden. Mm. Like oh, I don't want it to be like dad's in the kitchen making his coffee and not like trying to help pack the lunch or do anything. So I attempt, but you know sometimes it uh, doesn't go so well. <laughs> and what makes you think that you'd be an extra burden? Uh, well, it's just, there's so much going on in such a small period of time, like from, you know, from, from 7 to 7.30, all this stuff has to happen, and they have to be in the car, you know, some sort of yogurt pouch in their hand, uh, breakfast on the way to school, like, it's total chaos, and she's managing two, two of them, so if I don't have time to help, the last thing I want to do is, like, look like I'm focusing on myself mm. by making my own coffee or my own breakfast, even though I also need those things. Mm. Um... It's just a vast contrast to what our mornings used to be like, which was, you know, an easygoing entry into the day. And now my day starts with the most chaotic half hour of the entire day and kind of cascades down. Um, so I often feel bad for her because she takes the brunt of it. I've got one more question. You what? I've got one more question for okay. you. Okay, okay. So you'd saying, you said you didn't want to um, look like you were focusing on yourself. Can you describe that a little bit more to me? Why wouldn't you want to look like you're focusing on yourself? <laughs> well, <laughs> solid question. Um, because I'm hungry and I need coffee and like I have like three hours of sleep and I know um, I want to show up here and be present and be on my game. So I'm like, I've got a, I have a list of things I need to get done. I, and I am like, you know, I'm going to work as my role in the family. Mm. So I want to do that well. Mm. Her role in this particular scenario is taking care of the kids and getting them off to school. Uh, so we're, we are both achieving like a holistic purpose for the family, but in that moment, I look like the jerk. <sighs> so <Awesome. laughs> I, this, like this morning, I was just like, I will just get his pants and shoes on him. Did not go so well. And then I just, you know, dropped the mic and walked out of the room. She smiled, though, so <laughs> it's all right. Okay, I'm gonna pause us there. Thank you so much. No problem. <laughs> nice, all right, we're gonna pause there. Um, so as you guys notice, this is just a conversation, right? Like gaining empathy can be just as simple as a conversation. And a couple of things that I wanna point out that Barb did really, really well, because she's a pro at this, is that um, she sought a very specific story. She got, a, uh, and you know, so Jacob talked about today, right? Like what was it like today? Um, another thing that Barb did, I thought really, really well was um, that she really dug in for emotion. And why would it be important to have emotion? Why can't we just focus on the, the more tactical things? Why do we need emotion? Well, there's a large body of research that comes out of neuroscience that says that we make a majority of our decisions with the emotional parts of our brain. Very quickly, our brain backs it up with very logical and very practical reasons for making that decision, but in fact, all of those decisions are made with the emotional part of our brain. So we need to understand people's emotional experience as well as their tactical experience in order to design something really well. So that's why Barb dug in really well. So, and Jacob was great, right? He agreed to be vulnerable. This is a safe place. We can totally do that. And he got real with her. He said, man, I don't want to look like a jerk and I feel like a jerk. And, and so he was really good about being vulnerable and being open and getting real. And that's what we're going to ask you guys to do now. We're going to ask you to get real with your partner uh, about that morning experience. We're going to ask you to seek these emotional experiences and really dig deep on that. Anything you'd add to that, Barb? 
No, I think that the best way, though, is to start with a really specific question to seek a story. Totally. So the way that this is going to work um, is one partner is going to start. Uh, you can kind of just decide now who's going to start and who's going to be the second. You're both going to have an opportunity to interview each other. Um, but we're going to give partner A, for instance, uh, about five minutes to interview partner B. And then we'll call switch. We'll yell real loud and we'll tell you to stop and switch. And then partner B will interview partner A. It's critical to take lots of notes like Barb did. She wrote down a ton of stuff because you're going to want to refer back to these things in a minute. And then again, we're going to push you to go deep. Seek those named emotions uh, and have a really great conversation. Cool? All right, partner A, your five minutes to interview partner B starts right now. All right, first five minutes is up. Partner A, good job, nice work. Partner B, it's your turn. You have five minutes to interview your partner. And we're going to call time again. So five minutes, partner B, now interview partner A about their morning routine. Make sure to take good notes. Five minutes starts now. Big pause. Um, all right, so I was walking around a little bit, kind of like listening in on some of your conversations, and it sounded like some of you guys were having a, a pretty good conversation. I, I, I guess by show of hands, I'm curious, how many of you feel like you, you kind of got to know your partner relatively well in such a short amount of time? Yeah, right? Isn't that weird? It's just so weird. All right, so, well, that's great. Um, all right, my next question then is, how many of you feel like you got to a named emotion, like you were able to understand uh, clearly how your partner felt? Happy, sad, anxious, frustrated? Show of hands if you got to a named emotion. Cool, all right, what's up, pros? Nice job, <laughs> nice job. Um, all right, so then what we're gonna do next is we're gonna try to make sense of some of this empathy work that we just did. Um, and so what you can do is you can either rip that page off where you took all your notes or you can just flip it casually. It says a lot about who you are as a person, <laughs> just to be clear. Um, but we have this page and it should be titled, Make Sense of What You Learned. And what we're doing here is we're, we're gonna look back at our conversation and we're gonna say like, what is the, the one thing that was really kind of important here that I wanna take with me, that I wanna kinda turn into a little bit of a project for myself? And uh, maybe it was a pain point in your partner's life. Maybe it was kind of a, a point of like um, real joy or happiness that you discovered, something really amazing that took place in their morning routine. Um, but the way that we've done this is we've laid out this little like, it's kind of like a Mad Lib. Do you, did you guys do Mad Libs when you were kids? <laughs> yeah, right? right so this is similar. All right, so this first line says, I was surprised to learn. Um, so there's something I want to point out here is that uh, th this is just an observation. This is something that they said or a story that they told you they did. So this is very explicit. You're not making an assumption. You're not guessing. Um, they told you this. It's very explicit. Uh, the second thing I want to point out is that it should legitimately be surprising to you. Uh, if they said, oh, yeah, I'm sleepy when I wake up in the morning. <laughs> exactly, right? That's not surprising in any way. Um, if they say, I wake up and I jump right into an ice bath, that would be surprising to me, right? Um, so that's what the first line is. I was surprised to learn blank. Um, and then the next line is, I think blank might feel, so in our case, it would be Jacob. I would write Jacob's name in there. And then I would say he might feel um, uh, like he's not contributing or, you know, who knows uh, how he's feeling. But that would be a little bit of a guess for me. That's why it says, I think he might feel. I'm not sure how he feels, but it's what I think. And then the last one says, it would be game changing to make Jacob feel blank. What would be really amazing? If I could make him feel this other way, what would that be? So Barb has done a little bit of her work, uh, what we call synthesis work or define. Barb, what you got for us? Okay, so I wrote this for my five minute conversation with Jacob. So I was just surprised to learn that even after only three and a half hours of sleep, Jacob felt like an extra burden to his wife as she got the kids ready for school, especially when he couldn't successfully complete his task. I think Jacob might feel guilty that his duties for the family don't show up as easily as his wife's. It would be game changing to make Jacob feel rewarded for his intentions and efforts, not just his effectiveness. Mm, wow, that's pretty good, right? Yeah. She's good, she does this a lot. So, um, 
she's also very empathic. I mean, she's just naturally empathic, right? Some of us are good at building things and some of us are natural empaths and, and Barb's superpower is definitely. <laughs> um, so that's what we wanna do. This is a solo activity, but we're gonna ask you to just like, think about that conversation that you just had. Look over your notes a little bit and then fill in these three things. Um, what you learned, what was surprising, what do you think that, how do you think that they feel about this? And then how do you think it would be game changing to make them feel as a result of whatever solution you're gonna come up with? We're not solving anything yet. This is not the solution. We just wanna think about how we want them to feel in the end. Cool? All right, so you have about five minutes to do this. Again, it's a solo activity. Five minutes starts right now. And raise your hand if you have questions. Let's pause there. Um, all right, so you've had a conversation. Um, you've kind of gone back and taken a look at some of your notes and synthesized that conversation into one beautiful, succinct, poetic, kind of little Mad Lib, right? You've all done this. <laughs> yeah, all right, awesome. So what we wanna do now um, is we wanna move into, um, you know, a minute ago, Barb was talking about uh, being really mindful of process. And so I think it's important to, to point out that when we were doing an empathy interview, we were in a, kind of what we call a flare mode. We're just, we're understanding a lot of information. We're just having a conversation. We're not judging any of it. We're not critiquing any of it. We're not solving. We're just having a conversation. There's, it's kind of a flare moment. And when we go to define or synthesis, which is what you just did, um, we start to move into more of a focal moment, right? We have all this information and we're just gonna select one little piece to focus on. Well, now we're gonna open right back up again. We're gonna uh, go into brainstorm mode, ideation mode, um, which is all about uh, generating lots and lots and lots of ideas. Um, so I have a quick question for you guys. How many of you have been in a brainstorm before? Raise your hand for me. Okay, I'm so sorry. <laughs> I'm so sorry. We're, we're going to we're gonna try to solve a little bit about what happened to you in that brainstorm. Um, and the one thing, that, this is kind of the one place that we actually wrap some, uh, some rules around how to brainstorm. And because if you don't handle brainstorming appropriately, uh, it, can be, it can be very dangerous. It can, it can feel pretty <laughs> yucky. So um, notice in the upper right-hand corner of this next page uh, of Get Wild, we have a small uh, little group of uh, ideas here, or, or rules that we want to, to go over. The first one is um, this idea of like having one conversation at a time. So oftentimes you can like be in the middle of an ideation and you get really excited and then you start talking about this other thing that your aunt did last weekend at family dinner and then you know you start going off in several different directions. And so brainstorming, we ask you to stay really focused on one conversation at a time. Um, it makes it a lot easier. The second one is this idea of like going for quantity. This is not a place to try to find the best idea. That's not what we're here for. We just want to generate lots of ideas. And what we know to be true uh, is that the best way to get to a really great idea is to generate lots of ideas. Um, another one that we think is really important is uh, that we want to encourage you to come up with really, really wild ideas. So when you're brainstorming, especially for the first time in any innovation project or any project at all really, that initial brainstorm, it's really important to, to really focus on desirability. What often happens in a lot of organizations is we say, hey, let's have a brainstorm. The budget is $12 and you have three days to do it, go. You know, It creates our thinking or makes our thinking stay really, really small when we start thinking about feasibility or viability from the start. So what we're asking you to do is we're just focus on desirability. Just focus on the thing that will make your user really, really happy. And your user could be your employee, your business partner, uh, your customer, the person who pays you, um, any of those things, right? What is the thing that they're going to desire that's gonna really put a smile on their face? The next one is be visual while you're brainstorming. Uh, why is it important um, to be visual so if you're standing in a room and you got three or four people, and let's say um, uh, you're coming up with lots of ideas and one of the ideas is like, oh, hey, let's get a truck. And then you write the word truck and then you put it up there on the, on the board, right? And you're all looking at it and you're all going, yes, it's a truck. And then you ask one person, you're like, hey, what kind of truck were you thinking of? And they were like, well, yeah, like a dump truck. And then the other person was like, wait, no, I was thinking of a fire truck. And then somebody else says, no, 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 it's a cement truck. 
So if I had just drawn a little Ford F-150, we would all have been on the same page, right? So that's the importance of like really being visual. Oftentimes in, in our language and in text, ideas get lost and we all think we're on the same page, but we're not. So drawing a really little crappy sketch often works, little stick people, you know? <laughs> um, that's really helpful, so be visual. The next one, probably the most important rule in my personal opinion, is this idea of deferring judgment. Uh, why would you think, and I want, you, I want somebody to scream this one out. I'm not gonna ask for a whole lot of audience participation because I know it's hard without a microphone. Why would it be important to defer judgment in the midst of a brainstorm? But say that again, real loud. People want to focus on defending themselves against your judgment. Yeah, right? Yeah, people will want to focus on defending themselves against your judgment. And once I'm defending myself, once I'm in a place of fear and I'm defending myself, I am no longer going to be creative, right? It also feels absolutely horrible to be judged in the midst of a brainstorm, right? All right, here's another poll. Have you ever been in a brainstorm and your boss was there and he said, hey, I want to come up with a bunch of good ideas, and you come up with a good idea, or any idea, and he judges it in real time right in front of everybody? Raise your hand. Has that ever happened? Yeah. Right? To almost all of us. And it feels what? How does it feel? Yeah, I heard some cuss words. That's great. Yeah. yeah. It feels terrible. It really does. It feels really awful. And the best way to ensure that you don't get any more ideas out of your team is to judge their ideas in real time. That's the best way to ensure that you're not gonna get any more creativity. So what we wanna practice right now is just deferring judgment. We're deferring judgment of other people's ideas and we're deferring judgment of our own ideas. We will totally judge those ideas later. We just don't wanna do it at the same time that we're generating the ideas. That's all, cool? And then the last one is this idea of building on other people's ideas. Um, if, if you're familiar with uh, the improv world, this idea of yes and. Um, if you hear one person's idea, take that and build on it. You don't always have to come up with your own idea. Feel free to build on someone else's ideas. Um, enough talking about this. Let's uh, show you how it's done. Sound good? Okay, Parker, I'm going to ask yeah. you to be my partner because I need some fresh ideas. Cool, you bet. So I've, uh, you heard a little bit about the conversation with Jacob. Yes. So I've got a prompt for us. Okay. So post-its and Sharpie. Got it. Given that I want um, to make Jacob feel rewarded for his intentions, not just his effectiveness, mm. how might we redesign his morning routine? Gosh, all right, the, the first thing I think of is like um, those little like uh, bubbles that pop up with scores in video games as you're walking through like a magic land and like 1,000. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, he maybe, just gets little bubble scores for maybe his Maybe there's a way that you could like click on other dads and see how little they're doing. Oh, <laughs> so he nice. could feel good about how good he's doing. I love that, like, I love that. Compare like, a dad. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, uh, or even if he gets like um, kind of a dashboard of how other dads are feeling. He's like, oh man, there's six other dads in my neighborhood that feel worthless. Yes. That's pretty cool. Which I think like he really is a creative person he mentioned. Right. So maybe he could like make a podcast or a blog about what it's like to be this oh, dad. Yeah. I love the idea of like him getting real about like never feeling like I'm doing enough, you know? Yeah. Um, as, as kind of the, the, I don't know, the breadwinner of the family. Like, um, and then to hear from other people that are in similar situations. Yeah. Wouldn't it be cool if in the morning, his kids actually did stuff for him? So there was like this oh, yeah. reward process throughout the morning by his kids. Nice, nice, I like that. Um, it also makes me think of like, um, like what if his kid like walked in and was like, Dad, I know you were thinking about putting my pants on, I've already got them on. Like, <laughs> pants on, like you win. Yeah, or just like whatever he decided to do was okay. So if Henry went to school with no pants on, it's okay, because oh, Jacob yeah. decided, yeah. Nice, nice. <laughs> Um, I also like thought about um, this idea where his wife um, could be like somehow tuned in, like maybe she's got like some kind of a mood ring or something for Jacob, yeah. and she knows that he badly wants to help, but is like also focused on going to work that day, yeah. you know? So like, I don't know, some kind of mood ring for the wife. I almost imagine like, what if he had furniture? Like even his bed could talk to him in the morning. It's like, dude, you're doing a great job, sleep in. Oh, a nice. talking bed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Ooh, that's, what if he had like the, um, like as he walks downstairs, I, I picture like the angel and the devil, you know, like talking to him on each shoulder and the devil just disappears and the angel's like, bro, get your coffee. Right. Like you're good, you know? <laughs> 
I love it. What if he could actually like flash back in his mind to mornings with his dad when he was a kid and be like, mm. this is really normal and my dad's awesome and I'm awesome. Yeah, yeah the that, flashback yeah. machine. Uh, oh yeah, the flashback machine, I like that. All right, you wanna pause there? Yeah. Cool. All right, so that's what a brainstorm could look like. It's really quick. We just come up with headlines. We don't have to over explain anything. Uh, a lot of ideas could be fantastical, right? They can be magical. They don't have to be based in reality. We're not worried about that right now. Right now, we're only focused on desirability. We only want to think about the thing that would achieve our game changer, right? So here's how this is going to work. It's a little weird to brainstorm with the partner that you're designing for. So we're actually gonna have you find somebody else either at your table or at another table, you're gonna find a different partner to brainstorm with. And the way that that's gonna work is you're gonna take your sheet with them, you're gonna pick up a Sharpie and a pad of Post-its off the table, and you're gonna go to them and you're gonna read them that little thing at the top that says, given that I want them to feel blank, how might we redesign their morning routine? Just like we did for Jacob. Cool? So the way that that's gonna work is I'm gonna give you about four minutes a piece. So you're gonna take your thing, you're gonna find a new partner, doesn't matter where that partner is. Uh, we're gonna give you four minutes to brainstorm and then I'll call switch and then you'll have, it'll be same thing, partner A and partner B, you'll get to brainstorm with somebody totally different. Cool? All right, find your partner, 30 seconds. Sounds like there's a fair amount of ideas coming up. Um, really quick, how many of you guys got to five ideas? Raise your hand if you came up with at least five. All right, keep your hand up if you got to 10 ideas. A little bit harder, right? A little bit harder. All right, so this next round, it's partner B's turn to read off their statement and then you, you two are gonna, again, ideate. I'm gonna give you guys another pro tip as we're kinda getting warmed up in our ideation here. We're becoming really pro brainstormers. Um, Maybe stand up, get a little blood flowing. Just stand up right there at the table. Something happens when we stand up and our bodies are moving around. Uh, plus, you're gonna be sitting a lot today, so you know, it's a great opportunity to get a little uh, five minutes of uh, just you know, letting your legs shake it out a little bit. Next round starts right now, five minutes. Partner B, show your, uh, your statement to partner A. Five minutes of brainstorming starts now. All right, big pause. Our final pause on ideation. All right, nice job, you guys. Um, so that round, raise your hand if you felt like you got more ideas on the second round than you did on the first. Yeah, that tends to happen. It takes a second to warm up, you know, get some caffeine moving. Um, all right, so what we're gonna do next is well, I'd say the first thing that you can do is feel free to go on back to your normal seat. Head on back to where you were if you moved around. Grab your ideas, take your treasure with you. Thank your partner. Thank you, partner. You were a great brainstorm partner. <laughs> All right, so we're back next to our original partner. Uh, and what we wanna do now is we're gonna kinda go back into a solo activity. So again, if this was a big flare moment, if we're being mindful of process, that was a flare moment, we're gonna go back into a little bit more of a focal moment. So again, flip the page or tear that page off or whatever you're gonna do. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna choose a single idea. Out of all those post-its on your page, we're gonna pick one that we really like. It doesn't matter if it's doable. It could be about time travel or space monkeys. It, Totally doesn't matter if it's, if it's feasible or viable, as long as it's a really fun idea that will solve your game changer. We're gonna choose that one idea, and maybe it's a combination of a couple of ideas. Could be like a, kind of two or three ideas built into one. But we're gonna choose one, we're gonna slap it on the next page, and then we wanna spend just a couple of seconds actually drawing out, uh, with our great artistic skills, we're gonna draw out what it might look like if it lived in the real world. Like, what time of day does your idea exist? Where does it take place? Does it take place in the bedroom or the shower or at the office, in the car, on a train ride? Where does your idea live in the world? What time of day does it happen? Is there anybody else that's involved? What materials might be needed if you were to build this idea? 
And Barb's got an example. She's picked one idea from our brainstorm, and she's going to tell us a little bit about it. Yeah, so I went with the Comparadad app. Um, so this, this is actually going to be some type of application that he'll look at in the morning where he can see stories from other dads, kind of like dad fails, and submit questions. So I just kind of drew this out. I'm going to have it take place in bed in the morning using his phone uh, in order to watch these videos. Cool. All right, so that's what we're up to, is a solo activity. We're going to give you like three or four minutes just, again, to try to think about your idea a little bit further. So throw that stick it on there, and then just do a little bit of sketching so you can think about that one idea in a little bit further detail. Again, doesn't matter if you're drawing horrible stick figures. Uh, you're not going to show this drawing to anybody. Cool? All right, four minutes starts now. All right. Sounds like everybody's kind of wrapping up. You have a little bit more detail wrapped around your idea about what it might look like, where it might live. Um, now we're going to do something a little bit different. Um, we're actually going to bring that idea to life. So the way that we're going to build that idea is that we're going to use some really low fidelity or low resolution prototyping materials to build what we call an early stage prototype. And um, the way that we're going to do this is uh, on your table, there is a bag, just like that. Um, you're going to tear this bag open and dump out all the materials in it all over your table. There you go, just like Barb did. And you're actually going to build your idea. You're going to bring your idea to life in a way that allows your partner to experience your idea. So. There we go, rip it on open, let that stuff fly. It's totally cool, it's time to get messy, get our hands dirty a little bit. If you don't have a bag at your table for some reason, raise your hand, or if you need another bag, raise your hand. We have plenty. All right, so you have some really nice materials. You have an idea. Now what we want you to do is we want you to build that idea. And we want you to build it in such a way that allows your partner to actually experience your idea. So what we're not going to do is we're going to build something and then show it to them and say, hey, if I built your idea, it might look like this. No, 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 no. We're going to actually build a real life idea that allows you to hand it over to your partner and they can experience it in a way where they can give you legitimate feedback on whether this like, is really working for you or it's not. Does that make sense? So you're going to get busy, just like Barb is here. I'm going to give you a very short amount of time to build your idea, to really bring it to life in a way that your user can experience. So I can't stress this enough. You're actually going to let your user experience your prototype. It's not something, it's not like show and tell. Cool? All right, so you're going to have five minutes to build your prototype. That five minutes starts right now. Go. Big pause. Put down your glue sticks and your staplers and your paper clips. I promise that your prototype is not going to get any better looking than it is right now. Um, all right, so now we want to talk a little bit about what it is to test a prototype with a user, to test something with a partner. So a lot of people call this uh, beta testing or early stage testing or um, if you're from the leaner, agile world, you think about this as a minimum viable product, an MVP. Um, and so this is what we want to do now is we want to get feedback really early on before we've spent a whole lot of time or money uh, in this idea because we're not sure if it's good yet. We're not even sure if we understand the problem really well yet. So we want to test it really early. So when we talk about prototyping, we like to think of prototyping as a verb not as a noun, it's not about the idea, it's about having a better conversation with my user, with my customer. It's about better understanding their experience and their problems, and maybe I'm getting in the right space with an idea or a solution, but I'm not yet worried about that final product yet. I know that I will go through lots of cycles and I will do lots of iteration before I get to something good, so right now it's just about having a different kind of conversation. So, the way that we test is uh, that we actually want to get our user involved, and Barb's going to show us exactly what this looks like. 
All right, so Parker, I need you to hold this for me. Okay, got it. It's gonna be the screen, and uh -huh. I want you to play the role of bad dad. Bad dad, okay, okay gotcha. And then if, if Jacob hits this button, you're gonna talk and tell stories. If he hits this, you're gonna, this one that's imaginary, right. you are going to answer a question for him. Okay. Cool, okay. Yeah. All right, Jacob, come on up. All right. Hello, my friend. Hello. Thank you uh, for, for playing. I have created something for you. I see that. So I want you to imagine that it's the morning. Um, and before you go downstairs, you ha take a look at your phone and you like to watch an app called Bad Dad. <laughs> um, and you can <laughs> hit play to hear the person talk. And if you want to pause him and ask questions, you hit this. So I'd love if you just kind of interact with this and then I'm going to ask you some questions. OK. Cool. So I just woke up. Yep. Turn on my bad dad play. <laughs> oh my God. I did the dumbest thing this morning. I got home uh, from work, or, or this afternoon, I got home from work and I was exhausted. It was five o'clock and all I wanted to do was sit down and have like some scotch. And my kid wanted to play and he came up to me with those eyes and I could tell that like he really loved me and I knew that I was supposed to love him back at that moment and I didn't and I just wanted to like sit down and have a drink and for the love of God, kid, just like give me a second, you know? It's painful. Oh my God. So yesterday, dude, this was hilarious. Uh, my neighbor calls me and apparently my kid is actually in the street with no clothes on. <laughs> just running around naked in the street. A, we had no idea he was outside of the house. We definitely didn't know he didn't have any clothes on and he's just running around outside naked. Um, how did that happen? <laughs> well, I'd had some scotch after I got home <laughs> and I kind of lost track of what was happening a little bit. There was a game on and I kind of oh, spaced okay. out a little bit. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Oh, dude, you're never gonna guess. So the other day, I'm, I'm, this is granted, like I'm in a hurry, I'm leaving for work, and my wife's in the kitchen and she's making waffles. And uh, I can tell, like she's feeding all the kids and like getting them ready. And then I go up and I say, oh, those waffles look good. You mind making me some pancakes? <laughs> and pause. <laughs> pause, we're just gonna pause there for a second. Um, Jacob, what was that like for you? Um, Parker's a deadbeat. <laughs> uh, um, it was cool. Like I could, I didn't. I will say. So first reaction was I didn't understand the ask a question button. Mm. I didn't know, mm -hmm. like, if I was supposed to respond to his story or I was supposed to like uh, tell you know like maybe yell at him, maybe like a <laughs> yell at him button to make me you know. Ah. Um, yeah. I, I, I don't know about starting my my day by reflecting on how bad other dads are. Like, <laughs> um, it does. I mean, it does make me. I, I did feel like I'm not doing so bad, but it's kind of some negative input to have right out of bed. Okay. So that's interesting. So you don't want to start your day with kind of that negative input. Can you say more about that? You know, so I don't even like uh, look at my phone for the first half hour I'm awake. Usually because of that, because everything is just sort of you know, oh, bummer town. Uh -huh. So to watch other uh, dads fail, I don't know, you know what, maybe if the fails were more like f America's Funniest Home Videos fails, <laughs> but this guy's clearly an alcoholic who doesn't care about his kids. <laughs> so that's okay. Clearly. Okay. I don't know if that's the best thing funniest to Funniest Home Videos. Okay. Get it at 6.45? And what about what he shared made you feel like he was a deadbeat, like he wasn't doing it? This kid was naked in the street while he was drunk inside watching football. I don't, <laughs> I, I, I assume that, there's a boundary crossed there that maybe shouldn't be. Okay, that's really helpful. And um, on the way I was raised. Yeah, <laughs> on um, some of the first stories where he was talking about, you know, interacting with his wife or whatever. What did that feel like to hear those stories? Like the pancake story? Yeah. Oh, like you're doing something while you're at it, kind of thing. Um, I, I don't. Uh, I don't know what it felt like. It was. Okay. I, I already. I, you know. I, Another thing I couldn't tell with it was, is he, are the stories different dads? Mm. So, because I already like realized this dad is beyond repair. Mm -hmm. So the pancakes just feel like icing on the cake at this point. But if it's a new dad, I might be, oh, you got, you just didn't consider it. You can fix that. Uh, any other feedback? Um, 
Yeah, may, maybe if instead of asking a question, I could have just talked to the dad. Mm. Like, maybe we, like, message each other. Like, oh, I, I, like, you know, the, the, the one who's letting his kids run wild in the streets like Lord of the Flies, I may not talk with. But the one who's just asking for pancakes, I'd be like, dude, I did the same thing. Yeah. Ah, it's, yeah, we really got to get better. Okay. I, could, I could see that. Awesome. Hey, thank you so much. No problem. Thank you. All right, give, give it up, up for Jacob. Yeah, give it up for Jacob. <laughs> Thanks, buddy. All right, so what we did here is uh, that we offered Jacob an experience. I might venture to say that this prototype was a bit of a fail, which is not a bad thing, right? <laughs> like there were parts of it that like kind of weren't interesting, and then there were parts of it that were like, no go, like I don't want that ever. Um, and that's totally okay. We're not worried about getting it right this first time. We're worried about having that conversation about learning more about what Jacob would want in the morning. So now, if Barbara had to take another stab at it, right, we would probably understand that he wants to communicate with somebody. He would probably appreciate like more positive messaging first thing in the morning or something with a legit sense of humor. But a bad dad might not be the thing, right? So and Barb captured this with this little grid that we have. You've got it. Uh, there's a page for you there. It just has these four simple quadrants. You can use them or not. But we thought about, like, what are some things that worked about this prototype? What are some things that did not work? What are some questions that they had that we didn't know to, how to answer? And then maybe they had a couple of ideas. Like Jacob, you know, maybe it should be funny and maybe it should be uh, a little more inspirational in nature versus depressing. So um, this is where you can capture a little bit of feedback as uh, you do the same thing that we did. So partner A, you're going to let partner B, your partner, experience your prototype. Walk them through it a little bit. You can give them a tiny bit of context. Try not to over explain it. Um, let them really experience it. And then, just like Barb did, take a few minutes and say, hey, what was that like for you? And then ask them a few questions and dig into it a little bit further. Sound good? All right, so we're going to give you about five minutes to show your prototype. We'll call switch at five minutes, and then partner B, you get to show your prototype to partner A. Cool? All right, first five minutes starts now. All right. So, congratulations. You've just been through your first round of design thinking. Nice job. Woo! Nice work. So we have a couple of questions for you. We have a few people that are going to be floating around with mics. But we want to just talk for a second about how you would use this and what it felt like to try on some of these new tools. So um, before we jump into that, I would love to know if there's anybody in the crowd who had something created for them that they loved. Anybody? Anybody in the crowd that would be willing to share it? Up here? Oh, yeah, we got a few. We got Kristen? a couple down here. Mic runners. Keep your hand up. Help our friends out. Yeah, I got to. All right, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, perfect. Tell us, yeah, so what, something was built for you, right? Capri Sun. A Capri Sun. <laughs> All right, so tell it us a little. It worked perfectly. Tell us a little bit about that. Um, sun in the morning needs to eat within the first five seconds of, of the, starting his morning. Otherwise, he's a bear. So I wake up in the morning, uh, liquid uh, metabolizes quickly. We actually can have a drink together first thing in the morning, and we're both at ease. Nice, nice. Oh, I love it. And who's your partner? Can you, can you tell us how you came up with that? What is it that you learned from your partner? Well, just having negative interactions with your kid, first thing in the morning, it's a bad start for everybody and then you feel bad about yourself. And so just looking for ways to start on a positive note um, and something that creates a solution for the, the low blood sugar, or just not being on the same page or bonding at, at that first kickoff of the day. There. Awesome, Ooh, nice, nice job. Nice work. I think we've got another one up here. That's okay. We'll just hear from you. All right. Um, my name's Justin. My issue was I have a dog. My wife and I have a dog. And on the weekends, we change uh, days for when we wake up to take her out. Um, and I like to sleep in. So 
Uh, Leslie, who is my partner, came up with the idea of having a automatic door where she could just come up and it would recognize her and she would, we have a fenced in yard, so it'd be fine. She could go out um, and also an automatic feeder that could uh, feed her. Um, the only one issue was uh, we have a greyhound and they're bred pretty much to catch small game and there's little <laughs> squirrels and cats and bunnies that get under our fence yeah. and one of the things that we have to do every morning is go out and scare away all those little critters <laughs> so she doesn't bring me back a dead rabbit. Um, so that would be, and then we kind of discussed that a little bit and came up with the idea of maybe having like a high pitched frequency that we wouldn't be able to hear and wake us up but would scare away the, the critters and I can sleep in. Nice. I love how tech this one is. I this know. is really great. It's like, I just want to sleep in. It's like, all right, we have automatic feeders and we have automatic doors and there's a high frequency alarm that will scare off the wildlife <laughs> just to let the dog out so I can sleep in. This is great. No, my dog and your dog I should go bowling sometime. I think we've got one sometime. last one up here that wants to share, Chris, and all the way to the front. Hi. My, uh, my problem was uh, this morning I had a lot of anxiety. I had to do a, some comments at a breakfast this morning and then there was confusion about uh, between myself and Jeff who was gonna do the opening this morning and, <laughs> and have to get up there and talk. And so what Jeff came up with was just perfect. It was a bracelet with a reset button on there. And so when I get up and say something really stupid, which happens a lot, uh, <laughs> I can hit that reset button and bring it back and then get to redo it. Uh, and so it was a perfect solution. And I think we, we, we decided that it was important though to only have a limited amount of uses of the uh. button. So you just don't get too cocky in life. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. That's and, great. And what was it like to have something created for you? Oh, it was, it, it was great. Like I said, it was, it was very visual. You know, clearly this is a beautiful piece of work. Right. And, uh, it, it does, it, it, it brings it home when you can see the actual thing and, and uh, I'm gonna wear this around all day. I love it, <laughs> yes. Super cool. Um, so we, we wanna talk a little bit about what it was like to do this. So we, we got a couple of stories about um, outcomes, but I'm, I'm curious as to like what this was like for you guys walking through this kind of quick process. So, we often debrief um, just about everything that we do. Uh, we think it's a kind of an important way of reviewing our work and finding out whether we're doing good work or whether we have work that can be improved on. And so thinking specifically about process, um, we're curious about a couple of things. Uh, the first one that I'm a little bit curious about is, um, and this is for anybody, so again, we've got mic runners, but like, what was it like to build something for somebody else? Like we're so used to like designing for ourselves and creating our own little tiny solutions. What was it like to build for somebody else? Just raise your hand, we'll have somebody run a mic to you. Hi, I'm Tim. I, I felt embarrassed because I am the world's crappiest artist or builder. So I felt guilty that I wasn't gonna be able to design something good for my partner. And this is why the nuns helped me in grammar school with all my art projects. So <laughs> my, my, my first feeling went to being challenged about designing something that was bad, but the process was actually fun. I just felt bad that it was crappy looking. And, and how was it received, the crappy prototype? How was it received? He's a very nice man, so <laughs> he didn't judge. <laughs> I, I might venture to say that the reason that we make you guys use these really low resolution materials is so that you can get honest feedback. What tends to happen if we give somebody a really polished prototype is they feel like they have to give us good feedback because we put so much work into it. But when we're playing with low resolution or low fidelity prototypes, people feel very comfortable giving us very honest feedback, right? Like I will tell you that this idea sucks, you know, because it's in this low resolution format. But you know, if, if Barb and I had built out a, a real app and we'd programmed it and you know, I showed up on a computer and there was this real like, chat ability that Jacob had to interact with, he's gonna feel compelled to like, give us a little bit of a golf clap, like, oh, you did a good job, guys. Like, I can tell you put a lot into this, right? But that's not what we're looking for. We're looking for really good, honest, authentic feedback. That's the only way that we can improve is with good feedback. And so, having these low resolution, having these what we call intentionally crappy prototypes actually serves us better than having polished materials. So 
I'll, uh, I'll, I'll say that, you know, you get a plus one for being a bad artist. <laughs> yeah. Other people, what was that like? Yeah, in the back. You got a mic coming to you. Hi. Hey. So one of the big things I noticed is when I got all the information, I was a little bit overwhelmed to start the process, and I started thinking, wow, how am I going to make this, you know, a successful uh, thing that my partner can use? Um, and then as I started going through the process, it became easier, and the parts seemed to just fit into place mm. as I continue working on it. And then at the end, I was like, wow, this is awesome. You know, <laughs> so that, that's the big thing, the overwhelming feeling at the beginning, but then getting it to the work and then seeing how it all smooths out and it does all fall together. Because it's his information, not mine. Right. And yeah. although I don't have all the pieces, he gave me enough information that as I fit the pieces in, I could see the puzzle. Mm. You know, that's one of these things that I love about kind of taking the designer's mindset, right, and borrowing it for a little bit, is that I don't really have to be the expert. I don't have to know it all. I don't always have to get it right. If I listen really closely to my user, to my customer, and I build something that I think will be desirable to them, that will be suitable for them, then that's all I'm doing is just showing them a prototype. Hey, did I get this right or did I get it wrong? And they're going to tell me because, in reality, the customer is the expert. They're the ones that are going to buy the thing in the end. They're, going, they're the ones that are using the product in the end. Uh, and so, it's, for me, all I have to do is be really good at listening. That's really all I have to do is just be a great listener. Yeah, I love what you said, too, if you remember some of the mindsets we talked about in the beginning, this idea of being mindful of process. If I would have said, redesign your partner's morning routine, figure it out, you've got 60 minutes, it would look radically different than chunking it out and being really thoughtful about, hey, this moment I'm just learning, this moment I've got five minutes to build, um, and building out those little steps to accomplish those goals. We had another one at that table. Somebody else want to share? So um, building the prototype itself was totally frustrating because I'm an engineer, so I have an <laughs> analytical mind, and I'm not artistic at all. But the idea behind it was awesome because I am a problem solver, and it's always easier to solve somebody else's problems than your own. Yeah. Mm, nice. Yeah, yeah. That's great. I, you know, it's, it's interesting. Um, this idea, I, you know, we talked about this earlier, this idea of, like, who in here feels creative? And, Oftentimes, um, the words creative and artistic kind of get confused. And so we like to kind of draw a delineation between the two. Just because you're creative, because you create new things, you bring new things to life, does not necessarily mean that you're artistic, right? Um, I consider myself a creative person and a designer, uh, but I am in no way a solid visual artist. I cannot paint, I cannot sing, I cannot play the guitar, I cannot sculpt, I can't do any of those things. Uh, and so by like traditional standards, right, I would not be considered a, a creative person, but do I know how to bring new business models to life? Can I bring new products to life? Can I help companies get started and launched into the world? Yeah, those are things that I can create. And so being really clear like about being creative or about being artistic are two different things, which I, I think you bring up a, a really good point. The other thing is that most of us have not flexed a creative muscle since we were in preschool. <laughs> right? Like we're taught early on to put that stuff down, to quit playing with that stuff. It's time to be serious. Quit fooling around. You know, when we were young, everybody played with glitter and glue sticks and construction paper. We were all creative and we were all artistic. Um, it didn't mean that we were good at it, but we practiced it. But as time goes on, whether it's from our parents or from school systems or from our jobs, we're taught to put those things away. But what we find is that it has a really valuable place in innovation to be creative, to be thinking about uh, what other people need and bringing those new things to life. It's really good. I'm curious is to, uh, about the, the using these materials that we gave you. Like we could have given you lots of different kinds of materials to build something with. What was it like using these, uh, these low fidelity materials? Anybody, raise your hand. <laughs> like playing with your daughter and your granddaughter? Is that good or bad? Good, <laughs> right? Yeah, why is it good? It's 
It's always fun to play with children. And the cool thing is, is that children are almost always so much more creative than we are, right? They're not kind of constrained by everything that we think we can't do or what's real or what's not, what's serious and what's not. Children's creativity like trumps ours by a long shot. And I love that you use the word fun, uh, which is something that we don't normally believe uh, belongs in the workplace. Um, but since we spend a majority of our lives at work, like, I don't know, my personal opinion is that it should be fun. It should be really fun. Anybody else have thoughts on what it's like to use these materials? Way back in the back. You have to be really creative. <laughs> <laughs> you, uh, fewer resources you have, like it forces you to be creative. You have to be innovative, you know? Mm, the resources yeah. aren't there. I love that you said that because oftentimes uh, we hear whenever you're trying to come up with something new, we don't have the resources, we don't have the time. We are actually big believers that constraints are really powerful tools to create big innovation. When you only have five minutes in a set of pipe cleaners, look at what you were able to come up with. Nice. I'm really curious for a, for a final question before we jump into some stories. What did it feel like to start with a really broad challenge and empathy versus a directive, versus being told to execute a project? Curious if, whenever you have a reflection here. It felt like you care, so now I wanna know how this progresses for my partner and if it's successful and things get better versus just a project that you don't have any passion for. Wow, it's almost like we paid you to be here. <laughs> so that's really great. So this is, you know, design thinking, and one of the things that Barbara pointed out early on, right, is that it's human-centered in nature. A lot of times, as problem solvers, as engineers, as, uh, as designers, we are focused on solving a problem, on fixing a problem. But what design thinking does is it gives us this very human-centered approach. I am solving something for someone. Um, and my favorite example to give of this is because I came from the world of healthcare. Um, when we think about oncologists, uh, we think about a, a, a doctor, a physician that treats cancer. And there's generally, because I came from the oncology world, there's generally two types of oncologists that I, that I would meet on a really regular basis. Um, one is somebody who fights cancer. The other one is somebody who treats a patient. And the outcome is not always the same, right? Like if you have somebody that's treating the patient, there's somebody that's looking out for their quality of life, their ability to spend time with family. Uh, it's, not also, it's not always about longevity. The one that's trying to fight cancer might, you know, at all odds, uh, you know, bring to bear everything that medicine can use to fight cancer, whether it be chemotherapy or surgery or radiation therapy or something along those lines. And so, um, what we choose, what we're saying that design thinking is really good at being very human-centered in our approach to problem solving, um, which also I think allows us to, to get really clear, like Barb said, start from a really large problem and get very focused in a very short period of time. Any other reflections on Barb's question? How do we go from something so big to something so finite? All right. Oh, we got one over here. Yeah. You got a, Jacob's totally going to do the, like the <laughs> 500 meter dash towards you. See him? He didn't get his morning run in this morning. <laughs> he didn't sleep. So, moving a little slow. There you go. There you go, JJ. <laughs> I thought it was interesting the wide variety of solutions that we're able to come with um, based on the same general question of morning routines. Because um, looking around, all of these things are wildly different. I don't think I see two ideas that are remotely the same. So I think that's interesting to um, to analyze problems on that wide scale and see what we what we drill down into. It's mm. a good point. We we often work with an organization, and and so they're focused on something very specific. Uh, a team will come in, and we'll break that team up into groups of two or four or six. Um, and then we'll all have them all work on the same challenge, a lot like you guys did today. Um, and so uh, very recently, Barb and I were working on a group that was focused on millennial caregivers. So these are people that care for people that need caregiving, uh, but they're millennials, which is a little unusual. And so one of the things that we found is that um, 
there was such a wide variety of ideas that, that these teams came up with. And what we do is we call this the portfolio approach. And so instead of saying, hey, we as an organization have a really big challenge right now, we don't know how to solve this, we're gonna put one team or one person on it. You can do that, uh, but that means that you're gonna end up generally with one idea or one solution. And so what we try to do is if we have a few people on a team, we try to break them up and let them all tackle the same challenge and come up with a portfolio of solutions. And then they're all testing different ideas at the same time concurrently. Um, it's a much more efficient use of our time and our resources to let people tackle this in a, in a portfolio approach way. And then the teams can share learnings with each other as they're testing with different types of people. Um, and it really is a much more effective way of seeking uh, real deal innovation. Yeah. All right, y'all, we've got about 10 more minutes with you and here's how we're gonna spend it. We're gonna tell you two stories, just to give you some examples of how this shows up um, in other industries. And then we're gonna do one small thing to help you put this into action pretty quickly that will not require a lot of um, discomfort like we've experienced over the last hour. So we've got about 10 more minutes and we're gonna start with a story about Hyatt. Yeah. So. Hyatt Hotels uh, is an organization that we've worked with for a number of years now, and um, we've done lots of kind of different projects with them all over the world. Um, they're big believers in innovation, and they're big believers in uh, paying very close attention to their user, which is generally their guest. Um, and so one of the, ho the hotels that we were working with a, a, a number of years ago um, started seeing that they had, you know, different, I mean, they were just doing some empathy, some observation work. and so. Uh, to gain empathy by observation, you're just kicking back watching. You're just watching your user go through uh, a certain experience. And one of the things that they started to notice was that there were certain periods of the day where there were huge lines formed at the check-in desk. And so um, they were trying to figure out what was going on, so they went and asked uh, some of the people what was happening, because it happened really consistently. Uh, every Tuesday, every Thursday at 11 o'clock, uh, there was this huge line. And so, um, and one of the problems was is that they had uh, one of the Hyatt Passport people, if you guys know what Passport is, it's like their loyalty club, um, was sitting there and they weren't attending to anybody. And then the concierge was sitting there and he wasn't attending to anybody either. Yet there was this long queue in front of the one person that was working the, the desk. And so um, they started doing a little bit of research and they went and looked at this and they had all these comment cards dating back for about a year that pointed to the same thing. So they looked at a quantitative data set and they said, oh my gosh, man, this has been happening for a long time, but we've never really noticed it. It wasn't enough to register on our radar. Now we see it happening. And so uh, they did something very simple. They started to charge the concierge with checking people in and they started opening up the passport desk to people that weren't necessarily high at passport. It's a very obvious and simple solution but they didn't even know that it was a problem until they started practicing empathy work, until they did the observation work that was necessary for them to like really get clear about what's going on. And again, all it took was somebody sitting back and watching what was going on in a hotel lobby for 10 or 15 minutes a day. Not that big of an ask, right? And the thing that I, I appreciate about this story is that um, when we talk about innovation, we talk about this big process of starting with empathy and going to define and then ideating and then building a prototype and testing it, what we don't expect is for people to go home and do big projects like this. What we do hope that you find useful is to do one of those things. Like we hope that you go home and just prototype or you just gain empathy. Maybe you just hold a brainstorm, something like that, right? Like if you just take one tiny little thing home from this, then we would consider that like a win for innovation. Yeah. What's also really cool about this story, we get questions a lot about the interaction between data and design thinking, right? Because in the design thinking world, we're playing a lot with our intuition, which uh, in the last you know, 50 years of work, we aren't asked to bring that side of ourselves to work. But here, what they did was they started with data. They noticed a huge dip in guest satisfaction scores at certain times. So they used that to inform where they needed empathy. So we often say that data is great for breadth. For breadth. It's great for informing us where a problem exists. It's not as great for depth, where empathy can provide that depth. This last story that we're gonna tell is actually a personal story. So prior to joining Stoked, I worked for a huge healthcare corporation, 130,000 employees, and my job was to focus on developing executives. 
more specifically teaching them how to lead in new ways. So in 2012, we brought in Stoked. They learned design thinking um, and very quickly wanted more. So over a period of five years, what we did was actually instituted a program where they would learn design thinking and then have a year long to launch an innovation project. And so at any given time, you'd have 12 to 20 innovation projects using design thinking focused on our patients, focused on our physicians, that were in front of the executive teams at all times. So this started a whole new conversation about how we're interacting with patients, what their experience is, what the experience of our physicians and our employees is, and it really was magical. But what was way more cool was what we didn't expect, and that was the change in behavior of our leaders. We started to notice that they were talking about patients more by name, that they were more empathetic with their experience. And when we looked at the data, we noticed that all of the leaders that had gone through this experience, who had practiced design thinking for a year, were 20% more engaged than their peers. Also, 75% of them got a new, more senior job within three years. So it was showing up in the data too. And what we learned from that was that when you ask people to be creative and have fun at work, oftentimes they actually will and they'll enjoy it. But more importantly, to somebody's point back here, when you give people a reason to connect with the why, when you give people a reason to connect with the patient or the resident, in your case, every single day, they'll be much more engaged with their work. And that is really one of the most special things about this process. Mm. All right, so we're gonna wrap this up, but what we wanna do is we want you to take something home from this. We want you to actually experiment with something. And so what we're gonna do is we're gonna walk you through your final little exercise, so it's only take one or two minutes. Um, flip to that last page in your booklet for me. So what we thought about when we were uh, first thinking about coming here and working with you guys um, is this idea of like, what is a design project that you can take home? Something that you can try uh, very quickly, very easily, um, low risk of failure, right? This is not that big of a deal. Um, but it's something that you can learn from and experiment with very quickly. So what we want you to think about is something that we all experience every day, which is a terrible meeting. So I'm sure many of you have meetings pretty frequently. We want you to think about one, one that you contribute to in some way or that you regularly have to attend. Go ahead and put that in your mind. And we want you to actually write that down and, and do a little bit of a diagnosis and help us think, how do you think participants currently feel in that meeting? You might be a participant, so you can say, bored, waste of my time, um, not sure why I'm present, whatever it is, go ahead and jot down how you think participants currently feel in this meeting that you're focused on. And what we're gonna ask you to do, what the outcome of this is gonna be, is to make a small change in your meeting by using some of these tools that we've shared today. And the best way to do that is to give ourselves a game changer, give ourselves an aspiration. So if you think participants currently feel bored or underutilized, we'd like for you to say how you'd like them to feel. Maybe that's informed, inspired, Go ahead and write out how you'd like them to feel. And once you have that, we're gonna ask you, instead of just doing this on your own, we know it's way better when you get some input from somebody else, we're gonna give you five minutes as a pair to share what your meeting currently is and generate some ideas 
for how you might improve that meeting in order to make people feel inspired or informed. So your partner is actually gonna help you come up with a few ideas, and you're gonna help your partner come up with a few ideas, and then we're gonna select one. So we're gonna put five minutes on the clock. Partner A, go ahead and talk a little bit about your meeting with less than a minute, generate a few ideas, and then we'll call time and let partner B share. And remember, feel free to come up with wild ideas. It's not your meeting that you're helping design, so feel free to come up with some wild ideas for your partner's meeting. All right, if you haven't yet, uh, switch. Partner B, tell your meeting story to partner A and then have them help you design something amazing. Switch it up. All right, go ahead and wrap that question up. I'm kind of curious, does anybody have like one kind of like actually like really wild idea that they would be willing to share with us? Any one good crazy idea like, I don't know, bring a giraffe to the office or anything. I'm like, I'm curious if there's any like big wild ideas out there. Nobody got a really wild idea. Who's got an idea that they love that they're definitely gonna try? Right here? No, oh, in the back. Might need you to stand. Nice, love, love it. that. Love it. That's so for great. those of you that couldn't hear, he was just saying, so he has a, a meeting in an office, I think you said each week. Instead of doing that, actually have the meeting in the field. Right. Simply bringing the meeting to the action. Yeah. It's awesome. So what we'd love for you to do is just make sure that you pick one idea. We know from doing this for several years with several organizations that if you actually do something within the first 48 hours or right when you get home, you're much more likely to use these tools. So pick just one of those ideas and go ahead and make a commitment to yourself of when you're gonna give it a try. If you made friends with your partner and you wanna get their number and hold each other accountable, that is up to you. Sometimes that is really helpful as well. All right, guys, we are winding down our time with you. Um, first off, we'd like to say thanks a ton for A, sticking around, um, and uh, B, really leaning into something. We told you from the get-go that it was gonna be a little bit uncomfortable. I don't know if that was for you or not, but we often find that it's a little bit different than what normally happens uh, for people at different conferences. So thanks a ton for leaning in, for playing with us, for getting vulnerable with your partner, for playing with glue sticks and popsicle sticks and all that kind of stuff. We really appreciate your time and your energy and your willingness to play along. So hopefully you got something good there. Thanks a ton. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you, Thank you yeah. We're good. I'll come clean on this side. Looks like my daughter's bedroom over here on the floor. Um, what a great kickoff for WasteCon. I, I know one thing I surprised myself with is that actually I do have empathy. Um, I'm, I'm a driver driver, but I was, the exercises certainly allowed me to, to learn that I have an empathetic side and, and to hear from my partner and helping solve solutions. So I think that was very helpful. Also, the, the take home on the um, <clears throat> brainstorming idea and, and taking that back to some meetings where you can brainstorm with your other department heads or your other engineers in your office that may not be associated with solid waste management and get different perspectives on some solutions. So I think those are really good takeaways from today's, today's meeting. So I want to again, I hope that the workshop has inspired you to incorporate design thinking into your toughest challenges. I can't wait to hear how you've applied these new techniques in your work and your life. And please post your thoughts um, how you've incorporated design thinking on the myswana.org open forum. And I want to thank the Stoke team once again for coming and joining us today and helping us think better and design better. And just one final reminder, if you need CEU credits, when you exit out uh, the first two doors, your badge can be scanned and your CEUs can then be applied for your, your certification. So uh, enjoy the rest of the afternoon. The exhibit hall is open. We have other keynote sessions later this afternoon at 2 o'clock. Uh, there are a number of demonstrations going on, on the exhibit floor as well. So please 
uh, take, make the most of your day, enjoy your time here in Nashville, and uh, we'll see you all around on the floor. Thank you very much.